Welcome to Basic Business Statistics with your instructor, Dr. Todd Daniel. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Dr. Todd Daniel, and I am your instructor for Basic Business Statistics, QBA 237. This is our first week. We're going to be talking about data and variables in statistics. And as we get started, there's probably a few details about the class that we need to cover. So let's start with syllabus and schedule. Now, we'll be teaching this class using Blackboard. And if you need any information about the class or any of the resources from the class, Blackboard is the place to go. I have four sections. All of them have been combined into one shell because I have designed this in a way that we can move flexibly, seamlessly between a seated class and a fully online class. So I have some students who have signed up for a fully online class, and they get the same resources as you who are here today. I'm going to be recording each of these lectures, and I'm going to be posting those to a YouTube channel, so you will be able to uh, follow along whether you're fully online or in one of the blended classes you get the same information regardless of the modality that that you are enrolled in this also works in case you have to isolate if somebody gets covid i get if there is any break in the the continuity of the class we can seamlessly move online and move everybody back and you will always have access to the same materials so the, this Seated class is Tuesday and Thursday, and you'll be assigned to one of those two. If you're in a fully on, on, online class, you don't attend class, you won't have an assignment. But if you're in one of the blended classes, it'll be either Tuesday or Thursday, and I will let you know on Blackboard which class is yours. Of course, if we're in class, we all wear masks, uh, and you know how to wear them properly over your nose. As part of that, we've been requested to, uh, I guess we've been required to, uh, not have food and drinks in the classrooms. Especially true with a computer classroom because there's a lot of expensive equipment that things can get spilled on, but also it requires you know, taking off your mask in order to eat or drink. And so uh, we've been discouraged from having food or drink in the classroom. So if you bring anything in, uh, if you have brought anything in, leave it off to the side and then in the future you'll know not to do that. Let me talk about deadlines and now how they matter. We're gonna have two kinds of deadlines in a class like this. They're gonna have hard deadlines and soft deadlines. Now the class is gonna be structured in Blackboard. You'll see four folders, week one, two, three, and four. In each folder are the assignments for that week. And those assignments are due at the end of the week, which is Sunday at midnight. Those are soft deadlines. The reason for this is that it is quite possible that uh, you may need to have a little extra time to complete an assignment. I've already had several people that I've noticed as I looked at the grade book who are working ahead. So they've already completed week one and they moved on to week two and that's fine as well. So you have flexibility within the four week block to move at a pace that's comfortable to you. The deadlines exist to keep you on track, meaning that if you get to beginning of week three and you still haven't completed assignments from week one, you are falling behind. But if you keep up with the weekly assignments, you should have no trouble getting through everything that's required for you. At the end of the four week block, we'll have an additional week during week five. We'll be starting the second block, but we will have a week in which you can work on the test. Now the test is, uh, the, uh, the study guide for the test is already posted. So you can find that on Blackboard. It's in the same Block A section on Blackboard. Uh, so feel free to get that uh, study guide and uh, print that out and study along with that. Uh, as you learn things in class and you see a note about that on the study guide, make a note to yourself. This is something that you'll be tested on. Well, the test will be due at the end of week five. In end of week five, end of the block, that's our hard deadline. Everything from the first four weeks has to be completed by the end of week five. If not, it just gets graded automatically by the system software and it gets graded as a zero. So I'll give you plenty of reminders about that. Use the deadlines to stay on track, but don't stress about the deadlines. They are there as guardrails to keep you on track, but it's nothing that if you miss a deadline, if you're sick over a weekend, that you have to, you have to email me for uh, additional time, it's gonna be okay. My purpose here is to teach you statistics, 
And that's really what I want to be able to do. Do you remember a, a, a television show? It used to be on television called Win Ben Stein's Money. The idea was you were a contestant in a challenge against Ben Stein for who knew the most. And if you beat Ben Stein, you won the money. But if Ben Stein won, he kept the money. That was the premise of the show. Now, what I do in statistics and teaching doesn't work like that with points. In other words, I don't get a bag of points at the beginning of the semester, and any points that I don't give to you, I get to keep. I love it when students do well, get lots of points, you get an A in the class, so I'm not interested in restricting the points from you, tricking you out of points. I want you to learn, I want you to gain the information. So it's not about taking away points arbitrarily because you missed a deadline by a few minutes. But on the other hand, we have to have deadlines. And so there will be some deadlines in which it just absolutely has to be done by this point. We'll have plenty of notification about that, but when we reach those, if you haven't completed any of the assignments, any assignment that's incomplete would be graded as a zero. Well, as you may imagine, statistics is a science-based class. And I have a lot of years of experience doing the scientific method, but along the way I like to dabble in other things. And one of the things that I have found to be quite entertaining is to study mind reading. And so I want to start off my statistics class with an experiment in mind reading. And to do this, I'll need a volunteer. Can I get a volunteer from the audience? Does anyone? You, sir. You, sir. Yes. You. You'll be our volunteer. Thank you. Here's what I need you to do. Pick a card. Of course, don't tell me which one it is. Just pick one of those cards, the one that looks best to you, the one that appeals to you most, the one that speaks to you. Think about that card. Concentrate on that card. And I am going to look into your eye, and I am going to read your mind and tell you what card that is. Yes, I think I, I think I have, oh, yes. It was that, that little eye twitch that gave it away. I know exactly what card you picked. Let me prove it to you. Do you see your card up there, or did I remove it? My card is not there. Your card is not there, yes. So I am able to do mind reading, and I've demonstrated it through this experiment. Anybody skeptical about that? <laughs> Anybody think that maybe that's not, not maybe it's a trick? And if you're skeptical, I love it. I love skepticism because being skeptical about ideas, demanding evidence when we face claims, that is foundational to the scientific method. We face many claims of truth in the world. People who want us to believe certain things, to believe them, to follow them, to join their multi-level marketing program, or to listen to what they say and act in response to that. And we need a way of separating fact from falsehood. We need a way of evaluating these claims of truth. We need a way of figuring out what is real. And science is one way, and I think the best way, of evaluating evidence so that we can separate fact from falsehood so that we can find reality. And that is what we're going to try to do. Statistics fits into this bigger picture because statistics gives us a tool that allows us to evaluate the evidence using things like probabilities, to figure out whether or not a claim is likely or unlikely to be true. Now I'm going to introduce you to some new ideas, topics. I, I, I know these are words that you've heard before. So I know these are things that will be familiar to you. That's great. But what I want to do is maybe combine these in a way that you hadn't considered before. And certainly to give you the big picture. So I'm going to start with Data. Data are facts and numbers obtained in research. They could be words, they could be letters, they could be numbers. But what we do with research is we organize them. We organize numbers in a way that we can tell stories with numbers. Research is that procedure. It's how we organize data. And statistical research has really four aspects to it. Collecting data organizing data, analyzing the data, and then interpreting the findings. Those are the areas that we will be focusing on as we pursue this field of statistics.
Now, there's really three main forms of research that I want to focus on for this class. The first two we'll spend probably the most time with. I don't know if we'll get a chance to do the third. But these first two give us a great deal of flexibility and a great deal of breadth in what we can accomplish. I'll start with archival research. This uses existing data. And I love archival research because archival research, well, it's so much easier than other forms of research because it means someone else has already collected the data for us. Someone else has given us the numbers in the form of sales figures, employee files, credit reports. These data already exist. It makes them so much easier to analyze because I can simply get your Excel spreadsheet or your CSV data set. I can bring it into my system software, my, my statistical software, and I can, can analyze those numbers. A second form of research is observational research, collecting data, measuring things as they occur. Because, let's face it, it would be great if all of the data had already been collected, but every day we are constantly creating new data. And so if we want to know what is the gas price today, what is the state of the vaccine rollout for COVID today? How has that changed over time? We have to be able to collect data right now. Archival data have already been collected. We may already use those data. Maybe the gas prices over the last month, but we'll still be collecting data right now. That's called observational research, measuring the data as they occur. A very common way we do observational research is through questionnaires and polling where we create a survey, we give it to people, and we ask them to complete our survey for us. We can do this by, by hand, with paper, or we can use a program like Qualtrics or SurveyMonkey to collect our data. When you're doing data collection with observational research, if you're using a survey, one of the best things that you can do, my best advice for survey taking, is to use a validated survey. There's two things. A validated survey means that this is a survey that's been created and tested and we know how it works. So that gives us the benefit of what we learn from our survey is something that can then be applied with what other researchers have used. And the second advantage is the validated surveys, like archival research, are much easier to use. We don't have to create our own survey. Someone else has already done that for us. Third form of research that you will encounter, this is maybe the one that people think of most readily when we mention the word research, is experimental research. What characterizes experimental research is that it manipulates variables, or maybe I should say we manipulate variables as researchers, under controlled conditions to determine cause and effect. So if we have two groups that are exactly the same, have been treated exactly the same, except for one difference, then when we are looking at the outcomes and we see this one group that got this drug performed much better, we know that the cause and effect relationship is that the only difference between the group was the group that got the drugs, the experimental group, did better. Their, their blood pressure decreased, their performance increased, so something had improved as the result of that drug. We're able to establish that cause-effect relationship, and that goes a long way in science to telling us something valuable about how the world works. So those are three types of research. Having established those, it's important to remember that what we learn in a particular research study isn't really what we want to know. What we want to know is how the world works, but what we have are the results of our experiment. So we want to be able to conduct our experiment in a way that what we learn from our experiment applies to a larger world around us. Our sample tells us something about our population. So. The point of research is to be able to draw conclusions about a larger group of individuals based upon what we learn from a smaller group of individuals. So when I use the word statistics, it might be confusing because I can mean more than one thing by that terminology. The word statistics could take on multiple meanings, and it's important that we are able to, we are able to separate those meanings from each other. So the first way that I might use the word statistics is to describe the field of statistics. Statistics is a field that uses math plus logic to make sense of data. I describe it as telling stories with data. 
using numbers to convey something that is real about the world. It's the point at which common sense meets logic, where those numbers convey ideas. Now, the second thing that I might mean when I talk about statistics is the procedure of statistics. This is the thing that we actually do in the field. The procedures of statistics are descriptive and inferential. Descriptive statistics organize and summarize a large amount of data in an abbreviated symbolic form. Well, that, that's a lot to that, so let's unpack that. Let, let's just say that I wanted to describe the classroom. I wanted to describe all of you, everyone here in the class. And so I get all of you to tell me how tall are you. I get your height. So what I have done is given myself a way to describe the classroom. And I'm able then to say, this class at this time is, uh, they're all particularly tall and, and good looking and excellent students. I'm able to describe based upon characteristics of, that I observe using these descriptive statistics. So if I'm describing a classroom that way, I can do the same thing with numbers. I can describe numbers using things like a mean or a median or a mode. I can put them into tables. I can make pictures of them called charts or graphs. Those are all descriptive statistics. But you remember that it's not just what I want to know about this class or my sample. It's what I want to know about the larger world. And so we also have inferential statistics. Inferential statistics are the procedures that we use to draw conclusions about our data. If I know something about this class, let's say I'd never been to this university before, but I came here and I met you, and I said, wow, this is a really great group of students. I was really impressed by the people that I met. I bet everyone else at this university is going to be that same kind of way. I'm making an inference, an educated guess. I'm taking what I know about a small group and applying it to a larger group saying that what is true about this sample is also true about the population. Sometimes, many times, that works, but of course, I could have made an error. And so we also would need a way to determine how likely is it that what I've learned about my sample also applies to my population. And that's where we get into questions of things like probability. So the third thing that I could mean when I talk about statistics is I could be referring to the products of statistics. When we run numbers, when we calculate means and standard deviations, we are running the statistics. And remember, we want to know something about a small group that applies to a larger group. We could get the mean of a sample, but we could also get the mean of a population. And what we're going to find out is that the mean of our representative sample is usually a good estimator of the mean of the population from which it was drawn. But we also need a different word to describe the statistics that come from the population. Now, if we do a sample, we could survey that sample. But does anyone know what we call it when we survey an entire population? When we get the whole population, that is called? Census. Called a census, yes. When we get numbers about a sample, those are statistics. But those same numbers, the mean, the standard deviation, the, that applies to our census, to our population, those are called parameters. The easiest way to tell them apart is that statistics tend to use English letters, parameters tend to use Greek letters. The mean of the sample is M. The mean of the population is a Greek letter M, or mu. Standard deviation of a sample is SD, sometimes S. And the Greek letter that equates to that would be sigma. So we have mu and sigma and psi and lambda. When we see those letters, Greek letters, those are applying to a population. So what we try to do often is to take what we learn from our sample and then estimate population parameters. We take what we learn from our sample and apply it back to our population. So now we want to focus a little bit on the meaning of numbers, because numbers can do multiple different jobs. We need to know when we see a number one or a number two, 
What exactly that number means? Is one and two just different? Or is two twice as much as one? So we're going to start with our four levels of measurement, which I abbreviate as N-O-I-R, or NOIR. That stands for nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Well, nominal data are data that are used to name and to identify. A nominal data point just indicates a difference. So if I'm using one and two, I might use one as the experimental group, two as the control group. We know that it's nominal because instead of one or two, I could use something like colors. You're in the red group or the blue group. Or I could use letters. Or I could use pictures or icons. So whether you're in group A or B or one icon or the other, the icon, the color, doesn't tell us something specific about that group. It just says that they're different. Uh, so for example, if you were to go on uh, some kind of reality television dating program and you were asked to pick the person that you'd most like to go on a road trip with based on their social security number or their student ID number, is that information going to tell you anything about that person's personality and whether there's someone you want to spend multiple hours in a car with? Those are just identifiers. We know they're different but we don't know anything more about them. Another good example is a football jersey. Here we have player number four. These are not scales. They're not comparable. They're just numbers. And although there may be a zero point, it doesn't have any true significance. A zero or a double zero, again, just function as identifiers. Nominal data are categorical data. It tells us the difference between categories. Group one is different than group two. Group A is different than group B. Those are categories. Another form of categorical data are called ordinal data. With ordinal data, we do have the same difference that we have with, uh, with nominal data, except now there's an underlying order or ranking of these data. If you're in a race, do you want to come in first place or second place? You want to come in first place. That means something. If we have a scale of one, two, three, four that runs from strongly disagree to disagree, agree, strongly agree, if you are happy about this product, if your customer satisfaction is high, you're going to score a four on a question like this. Now that doesn't mean that your view of a four is the same as my view of a four. I can compare within a scale, I just can't compare between scales. If you think of the winners of the Daytona 500 over the last four or five or six years, let's just use the last three, it'll be simpler. Over the last three years, somebody came in first place each time. Which one of them was the fastest? We don't know. They all came in first place, but we can't compare between the scales to say which one ran the fastest. It is comparable within a scale, so I know the first place finisher was faster than the second place finisher, or third or fourth or fifth, but I don't know how they compare between scales. Now, ordinal data don't have a zero point. You can't come in zero place. Both nominal and ordinal data are categorical. They just tell us differences. If there's an underlying order to those difference, first, second, or third, they're ordinal. If not, there's no order, they're just nominal level. Nominal in order, categorical data. Then we move to the kinds of numbers that do begin to tell us something about quantity. They answer questions like how many or how much. There are two types of data like this. They're interval and ratio. We end up treating them exactly the same. In fact, they're often combined and called scale data. But interval data reflect a relative amount of a difference. Now let's use a thermometer as an example. The distance between each marking on that thermometer is exactly the same. So if I measure something at 30 degrees or 50 degrees or 70 degrees, the number of degrees between 30 and 50 is the same as between 50 and 70. The intervals are the same. But because it's a relative difference, 
those numbers may not reflect an underlying construct. So if you have the option of being in a room that is either 50 degrees, 70 degrees, or 90 degrees, which room would you choose to spend time in? Probably the 70 degree room, because 50 is gonna to be too cold and 90 is gonna to be too hot. So it's not like more is better. If I offered you one of three envelopes, which have 50, 70, and $90, then which one would you choose? 90. Obviously the $90, because that does have, that's our, that's our true amount of a scale. So a temperature can tell us something, can be very, very useful, but the relative amount means that it may not be measuring something underneath that scale, like in this case, comfort. More is more, it's not necessarily better. What distinguishes between, nom between interval and ratio level data is the presence of a zero point that has meaning. If you think about a Fahrenheit or a Celsius scale of temperature, there is a zero point, but can you have numbers less than zero? Of course, it could be 20 degrees below zero. That's really, really cold. It's a negative number, so we can have a value less than zero. But do you remember the scale where there is an absolute zero, where when you, when you reach zero, it's the absence of molecular motion? It's called the Kelvin scale. That is a ratio level. Ratio data reflect a true amount of a variable that is present. That means it has an absolute zero. It cannot have negative numbers. You cannot be less than zero. It has the same equal intervals as interval type data. And it is comparable both within and between the scales. Now I said that we'll treat interval and ratio the same way in statistics, and we will. So the important thing to know is that these are continuous data versus categorical data. Now I know that this is sometimes a lot to wrap your mind around and more than that just to keep track of where all the pieces fit. So let me walk through this with you one more time with a diagram that will show how these, re these ideas relate to one another. We're going to start with data. So our data will be either categorical or quantitative. Does this number represent a difference, maybe an ordered difference or an unordered difference, it's categorical. Or does it tell me an amount, in which case it would be quantitative. For categorical data, those data could be either numeric or non-numeric. So I could have group one and two, or I could have group A and B. Numeric categorical data can be nominal or ordinal. And non-numeric data can be nominal or ordinal. Nominal and ordinal, regardless, are always categorical data. Now on the other side, we have the quantitative data. These data cannot be non-numeric. We can't compare you know, uh, B divided by Q. It's numeric, it's numbers. And so those numbers are either going to be interval or ratio. And we will treat them the same and call them scale data. So that's a lot of information about numbers, individual numbers. But what becomes really fun in statistics is when we combine numbers, when we group numbers. Because when we create collections of numbers, they become variables. Now what is a variable? It's a, it's a bunch of numbers. Anytime we collect a grouping of numbers measuring the same thing, we have a variable. So really a variable is anything that can vary, can take on more than one value. So just think of you know, biometrics, you know, what are things that we can measure about you. Uh, I could measure how tall are you. Now for you, your, your height is going to be a constant. A constant can assume only one value. So remember, in statistics, we're not talking about the individual. We're talking about the collection of data. I want to know from a lot of individuals. I want to know from everyone, what is your height? Now, when I consider the group, is height a variable? Is everyone the same? Or do we all have different heights? 
this is a variable. Uh, your weight, our weights are all going to be different. Those are variables. Uh, those two are related, height and weight. Uh, tend to be as you grow taller, certainly worse in childhood, as you grow taller, you weigh more. There's a relationship between those two variables. Um, and we can measure other things about you. Now, we could create variables based on words, like are you a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? That's also a variable. It can take on more than one value. In this case, there are four categories. We have categorical variables, we have numeric variables, Anything that varies that can take on more than one value when we're considering the group, that is what we're going to call a variable. So as I said, we could have categorical or we could have numeric. Let's describe those in a slightly different way. Quantitative and qualitative. Now here we're getting into different words for the same thing. Quantitative variables indicate an amount. They're expressed as numbers, heights and weights and grade scores. Those are going to be numeric, continuous, variables. Qualitative variables indicate a category. So they could be words or numbers, your grouping, experimental versus control, type A personality versus type B personality. So these are categorical data. All I want you to see here is that we will use different words for the same thing. So if I'm referring to quantitative and qualitative methodology or qualitative and quantitative variables, I'm still referring to categorical and numeric or continuous, so categorical versus continuous variables. All the same idea, but sometimes we describe them in different ways depending on exactly what we're doing with those particular numbers. So what makes something a continuous variable? Well, a continuous variable is one where we have numbers, and the numbers allow for fractions. Uh, if I measure your temperature, uh, anybody been doing a lot of temperature measuring lately? I have one of those devices that I can hold up to my head and it tells me you know, how warm my, my body temperature is. Um, and it comes back somewhere, uh, well, 98.6 is supposed to be the average. Mine always comes back uh, in the low 98s or upper 97 numbers. Uh, so I know that I, I tend to run a little cooler than average. But there often will be decimal points attached to that. Those are continuous variables. They allow for fractional amounts. They allow for decimals. Versus categorical measures, which can only be whole numbers. So if I ask you, how many cars do you own? Or how many children do you have? How many pets do you have? Those have to be whole numbers. The thing to remember about both continuous and categorical See, with the categorical, if we use things like a mean with categorical data, and sometimes we can do that, and there's a reason why we would, it can give us kind of misleading numbers, like the average American family has 2.3 children, or the average American owns you know, 1.4 cars. No one actually owns a decimal point versus a decimal point worth of cars, but it still makes sense. And the reason we use things like a mean with categorical data, is usually for planning. So for instance, if I know that our community is going to grow by a thousand families in the next five years, well, and the average family has 2.3 children, there's a thousand new families, can I get a good estimator of how many more seats we're going to need in the, uh, in the public school? So I can use those numbers for estimating, even though they don't apply to individuals. But there is a special form of categorical variable that is called a dichotomous variable. In statistics, we love dichotomous variables because they are so clean, they're so easy to use, they work with cross tabulations beautifully. A dichotomous variable is one that has only two values. So for example, pass, fail. You take a class, you're going to have one of two outcomes, pass or fail. You won't both pass and fail, or neither pass nor fail, one or the other. In the last election, were you a voter or a non-voter? It has to be just one or the other. Living or dead? You have to be one or the other. You can't be both, you can't be neither. Although, if you've seen the movie The Princess Bride, we do have the option for being mostly dead. Although, that doesn't show up a lot in statistical and scientific research. 
What do we do with all these variables? We put them together. We collect our data. We put our data together in a data set. This is our collection of data that we're able to do then analyses with. So this is a, a data set uh, that you'll get to see in the future. It's one that I made up uh, as I was spending a lot of time at home with my dogs. And so I made up a data set called Dog Toys. And the theoretical idea here is we survey 50 dogs and we ask them things like, how many dog toys do you own? And what is your favorite dog toy? And then we make note of how large or small the dogs are, and we categorize them as small, medium, or large. So let's just take a look at a data set and make sure you know how the variables are structured. A variable will always be placed in a column. So the up and down, that's our variables. In this case, we have three variables, toys owned, favorite toy, and dog size. The rows are the number of cases or observations, or participants, or subjects. So we have um, there's a, a total of 12 in this data set, except the top row is the name of the variable. So we have 11 cases, 11 dogs, are represented in this miniaturized data set. Each of the cells, the data points, if you will, those are elements. So the four, or the rope bone, or the small, each of those represent an element. So how many elements do we have in this data set? Well, we have three variables. We have 11 dogs. There are 33 elements in this data set. And we could also characterize the type of variable using the terminologies we've already learned. So for example, which of those, dog toys owned, favorite, or dogs, which one of those would be nominal, where it just describes a category, they're different, but there's no underlying order? That's going to be the favorite. Which dog toy do you like the most? And how about an ordinal variable, one that gives us an order? What's going to be dog size? And of course, the scale variable is going to be the number of dog toys owned. Cross-sectional data are data that are measured at the same time, or approximately the same time. So these would be independent designs or between subjects designs. Well, the other way that we could go about collecting data is through a time series, where the same data are collected or measured repeatedly over time. This is called a dependent measures, also called repeated or paired. We'll talk about like repeated and paired t-tests, or within subjects design. So for instance, if we were measuring gas prices today, is that cross-sectional or time series? We're just getting it for today, so that's going to be cross-sectional. Yeah, cross -sectional. But how about gas prices over the subsequent months? There's time series. So we're collecting the same data point, gas price, over multiple weeks or months. A before and after study, where I measure you once, then we do a treatment, I measure you again to see if something changed. Time series. We're measuring you more than one time. Those are the time factors that we'll see. Uh, we'll use these for, uh, ultimately, we will use these for things like time series analyses. Uh, we'll see them with independent samples t-tests for cross-sectional data. We'll look at repeated and paired t-tests. We can also do the same thing with ANOVAs. Now, some of those tests we're going to be doing in our next class, our next section, which would be QBA 337, which would be Applied Business Statistics. I'll be teaching a section of that in the fall, and so if you've enjoyed this class and you want to sign up with the QBA 337, we can just continue right along. Love to have you when we get to the fall. So now I want to kind of bring together some other ideas, talking about academic research, talking about doing science. Uh, another terminology that you will hear used attached to variables is independent variable. An independent variable is when we do an experiment, we control something. So we want to keep the groups exactly the same. We have randomly selected uh, a, a number of individuals to participate in our study. We've randomly assigned them to an experimental and control group. We, we assure that those groups are the same in all ways, as much as we possibly can. And then one group gets the drug, and the other group gets a placebo. 
The fact that we are controlling which group gets the drug and which group gets the placebo makes the drug versus placebo an independent variable. That's the one that we manipulate. And then we measure the dependent variable. So the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. And maybe that's blood pressure. Uh, does the blood pressure decrease as a result of this drug? Or maybe it has something to do with performance. Does performance increase as the result of this training that we've provided for our groups? Our dependent variable changes in response to the independent variable. So our independent variable is called a predictor, and our dependent variable is called an outcome. You will also sometimes hear it described as a criterion variable, although I think that that term has sort of fallen into disuse. I typically use predictor and outcome when I'm talking about regression equations. And I'll use independent and dependent variable when I'm talking about doing scientific research. So anytime that we manipulate an independent variable and measure a dependent variable, we're doing an experiment. But it's also important that we not just rush into an experiment just to see what happens, because when we do experimentation, and particularly when we do things like data mining or just collecting large amounts of data, it's quite possible that uh, we, there will be differences that exist just through randomness. So it's important that we, we stake our bets before we do our research, before we do our experiment. What I mean by that is we want to state a hypothesis of what we think will happen, and then we see whether or not it happened, versus saying, I bet if I do this, something interesting will occur, we want to be able to say, here's what we think will occur, and we test for that. Now, that's called hypothesis testing. And that will actually be in the last block of what we'll be studying for this course. Teach you all about how we do hypothesis testing. We understand uh, what we are looking for and what the results actually mean. And then finally, subjects, participants, uh, which we also referred to as cases early on. Subjects and participants essentially refer to the same thing. Uh, I've, I've often joked that in animal studies, your participants are subjects, but in human studies, your subjects are participants. If we're doing human studies, you will use the word participant. Uh, if we're doing uh, something that doesn't relate to human beings, if we're just looking at you know, the number of cars sold, we might use the term like, like subjects, but they're all referring to the same idea. And these are the variables that will go into rows. There's a lot of things to know about statistics and science and research and experimentation. But what I want you to take away from this first lecture is the idea that fundamentally what we do in science is we ask and answer questions. We call them research questions, but they are just like the kinds of questions that we ask every other place in the world. And so I, I have this poem from Rudyard Kipling that I just love. I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. That's how we do science. We ask, why does this occur? And in what way? And when does it not occur? And what might moderate the relationship between these two variables? We look for questions and we seek the answers to those questions. And that's how we do research. So what I want you to see is that statistics, yes, it can be complicated. There's a certain amount of math that we're going to be learning. But all of this is part of a larger pursuit, and that is figuring out how the world really works and asking and answering questions. And so with that, I should ask you, do you have any questions about what we've covered today? Anybody in the back? No? All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we will have another lecture next week. I will be posting these lectures so that if you were taking an online class, you can also follow along. Everybody, regardless of online or blended, you get to see the same materials. So I hope this has been helpful for you. I will see you all. Thanks for being here. See you next week.